Great. Okay, so yeah, Sarah, please do move straight on to the next slide. So I've told you a little bit about me. Um, so I had somewhat a, a wonky career through kind of marketing, PR, comms, um, media, into leadership, but as I said before, always in the travel and tourism sector. Um, and as Pete said, I uh, we kind of connected over LinkedIn. I'm a bit of an oversharer, quite a prolific online networker. Um, and I actually did a survey of my network last year because I take my personal brand quite seriously and I'm really keen to grow my reputation online because one of my ambitions is to do kind of a, a TEDx talk at some point in my career and be my my goal sheet that's pinned up on my uh, wall next to my desk says to be an internationally requested speaker so um I, I aim big um but the survey results were interesting because I asked people three questions I asked them what am I known for what am I good at and what makes me stand out from other people and I expected kind of, oh, she's creative or she's good at PR or um, whatever it might be. And the results were absolutely categoric. And it was it was quite astounding how consistent all of those responses were. And there were three key themes that came out in that. And I think Pete's probably touched on some of them. But um, they, those were bringing people together, getting shit done no matter what. Um, being very straight talking and speaking my mind one one response said um comedic brutal realism I, I think that's a compliment I'm still on the fence about that but I think it's a compliment um and sharing my entire story the good the bad um and being incredibly candid about that and um it was interesting to see what people's perception of me was and we're talking today about being brave and I think we're going to touch on personal brand a couple of times and I think really knowing um, what you stand for and how people perceive you is very interesting. Um, another one said results are more important than her popularity which I think that was really interesting so getting things done and getting people together over being popular or your motivation being driven by ego is really important um, and the other one said she connects rather than competes and I feel like I'm in really good company to have that string to my bow today because it's very clear from everyone's introductions and raving fans that um, everyone here is very much in it to connect rather than compete so um, thank you very much for welcoming me into such a friendly group morning. Um, so I'm going to talk to you today about the bravest things that business owners do um, so is everyone feeling brave this morning? I hope so, um, because I really want you to take away. Excellent. Kelly's definitely feeling brave and strong. Um, there are some things I've done myself, and I'm going to share my own experiences, as well as a few watch outs and case studies of people who do these things well and people who do them badly. Um, now, I, you're all smart people, so this is less about teaching you new tricks and more about encouraging you to own your expertise and make it work as hard as possible for you, very much like Kelly's been doing in terms of confidence with public speaking. Um, because it's a bloody tough gig running your own business and growing it, isn't it? And I know a couple of the newbies here today said um, that they've made some big decisions over the last couple of years or a couple of you are looking to move to running freelance businesses. So I'm hoping that this is really well timed and, and gives you some new ideas. Uh, next slide, please, Sarah. OK, so we're going to go straight into my first brave thing that business owners do. So your thing is a bit crap. Now, this is about telling a potential client customer that their product or service just isn't up to scratch. Has anyone done that before? Because I certainly have. Um, I had the past client. Let's let's call him Brian for ease. Have we got any Brian's on? We haven't. <laughs> I'm not going to confuse things. Good. Um, so this was back when I ran a PR agency in Oxford and Brian was my client and Brian ran um, a business, fantastic business called University Rooms. Amazing concept, you basically rent out a room in a university out of term time for, for next to nothing. So you can literally stay in Christchurch College in Oxford in a Hogwarts-esque room um, for 45 quid. And it was such a brilliant idea, but the problem was his website was absolutely awful. It was so unuser friendly. The photography was awful. There was no aspiration or emotion in there at all. It was purely functional. So that whole magic of this opportunity to stay in historic buildings in the 
kind of most interesting cities across the UK was totally lost. But this isn't about going in with a list of negatives because clients tend to be sensitive souls, don't they? And rightly so. So this isn't about going in with an outburst of criticism and saying, um, this is wrong, that's wrong, the other's wrong. Even if they know there are problems already, people don't particularly like to be told your website shit. Um, I had an interview candidate a couple of weeks ago actually apply for a partnerships manager role and he his approach was to sit and list all the things one of our attraction partners were doing wrong and it came across really badly because he had he'd just gone straight for the negatives um, and and it didn't end well for him he, di he didn't get the job so this is about three things creating a really healthy dialogue with your Brian, whoever your Brian is, um, one where you're the expert and you can really own that. And there's a kudos attached to the value you add. And it's about not being afraid to own that conversation. It's not about arrogance at all. How being an expert isn't arrogant. It's about quiet and considered confidence. It's about opening a conversation and, and always letting your Brian go first. So Brian, you need to ask Brian kind of, what are your challenges? How is this impacting your business? What's changed since COVID? What does good look like? What does extraordinary look like? How do you see me as your partner, agency, coach, um, supporting those challenges? Let Brian own that conversation. So the bravery here, is, is taking a step back, owning your expertise and letting Brian lead. Um, then rather than going in with kind of, Brian, your website is the worst I've ever seen. Did you actually write that horrific mess? You go in with something totally different. You go in with, it's interesting because have you seen what XYZ brand business supplier are doing in your, in your sector? It's interesting because they are scaling, creating a wider reach, um, enticing a new audience so you're not tearing apart what Brian's doing you're talking about what's happening around Brian's sector yeah. it's far more productive and again you're stepping in and owning your your niche your expertise and we're going to talk a bit more about niches um, so the third part of the equation based on those first two points is making yourself absolutely indispensable there's an extra opportunity here if your client is manager level and you can make Brian, the manager, look exceptionally smart to their boss and let them take the credit. This is, this is an absolutely winning formula. You sit behind the scenes as the expert. You give Brian everything he needs to know to make his business more successful. And then Brian goes to get go back to his chief exec, his director, his board, um, and, and take ownership for that new knowledge and expertise about where the problems might lie and what's happening in the wider industry. Um, and Brian's about to shine. Brian's about to love you more than he's ever loved you before and potentially spend more money with you, which is ultimately, ultimately what we're doing to try and grow our, our business. Because when you show expansive knowledge of a market or sector, you earn the right to say your thing's a bit crap in a really dem democratic way. Um, it doesn't come across as a criticism. It comes across from a place of expertise and authority but also in a really humble way which is that's the winning formula as far as I'm concerned um, so when you've done this in a really smart brave way letting them take the lead making them feel like the clever one but some subconsciously making yourself an absolute necessity in Brian's life you're going to win that new business you're going to retain that client you're going to grow that relationship so just quickly before we move on to the next point, there's a watch out here and I've put a watch out attached to every every um, three pieces of advice I'm going to share. As I said, don't go in with the heavy guns. Reciting your prepared list of things Brian has done badly just won't go down that well. So that's the watch out. Who does this particularly well? Well, by nature, coaches and mentors do this really well because they listen. They listen and ask questions, so they do it really well. PRs tend to do it really well because a lot of the time they're media trained to listen for those silent cues and let the, the let the um, Brian take the lead. Um, stylists, personal stylists do this really well. Understanding why you're not happy with the way you look, what might change the way you feel about your self-image, that kind of thing. Again, they listen. And then rather than saying you look like shit, you're overweight, your hair's the wrong colour, your eyes are too close together, your eyebrows really need taming, um, <laughs> they, they will go in with, OK, have, have you seen this person wearing this colour? And they'll really cleverly pick out people who 
maybe from the media who look have similar skin tone, hair colour, body shape. Have you thought about lilac? Oh God, absolutely not. I don't want to wear that. Well, let's talk about that. They're really good at it. Who do, does this badly? No offence intended. Um, and speak to me after if I've hit a nerve and we can make up. Um, <laughs> Pete, Sarah, networking hosts can sometimes do this really badly. Sometimes. Present company excluded. But sometimes um, you get carried away with the me momentum of being the host and you go into kind of feedback mode, not listening mode. Pre like I say, present company, absolutely excluded. I think you're two of the best hosts I've ever come across for a networking event. So pension advisors are often bad at this. They go straight in with the, your pension's not making any money. Um, you're with the wrong provider. You need to be with me. Franchise owners sometimes can be guilty of that as well. Um, stop dissing the competition, focus on your expertise. That's the most important thing. Next slide, please, Sarah. Two, we only work with ginger haired schnauzer owners. Now, this is obviously a bit of a clickbaity title, but who really knows and understands their niche and their audience? Let's have a show of hands. Who feels like they absolutely know who they're talking to? I'm glad to see Pete and Sarah have got their hands up. <laughs> Fiona's got a hand up. I don't know if I can see everyone's faces at the moment, so apologies if you've got your hand up and I can't see you. So I'm not saying you need to go this niche. I'm not saying your customer needs to be a gingerhead schnauzer owner. However, if you want to know the number one thing people fail on when trying to create focus around their old ideal customer, let's call her Vanessa because we've used Brian. We, I don't think we've got any Vanessas on either, have we? Um, knowing the problem that you solve for Vanessa is absolutely imperative and so many business owners um skip over this who was it who said they were just about to go freelance apologies i'm rubbish with names someone on in the introduction helen. 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 helen helen so helen do not skip over this point you have to absolutely know when you're creating your marketing strategy business whose problem you solve because it's not everyone's it's never everyone's problem it's someone specific or a couple of very specific niche groups and you talked very much about using your um past aviation experience i think it was to create a niche there as well um and to know that obviously you've got to know your product and service inside out which I, I, i'm pretty confident that everyone on this um call this morning knows their product and service inside out so you've got to understand the problem you solve for vanessa and sometimes it's not what you think and you've got to know this stuff absolutely backwards. If you don't feel utterly comfortable and confident saying it out loud on a networking event like this or a face-to-face -face networking event, then you haven't nailed it. Now, I'll offer you something. If you LinkedIn message me after this with your one-line elevator pitch, I'll be 100% honest about whether I get it or not. Now, I'm not a guru. I'm not going to walk over hot coals, Tony Robbins style with you, but I am an impartial second opinion, someone who I've hasn't met you before doesn't know your business and I will give you an unbiased opinion okay so let's go back on track to what problem you actually solve firstly if you don't understand the habits of your audience you need to be brave here and ask for feedback show of hands of who's actually surveyed their customer base about their habits who's actually asked why they do the job they do why they get up in the morning what whether they have kids, what they do in their spare time, or do you actually have a customer persona in mind when you're marketing your business? Can you visualize that person? Do they have a name? It's so important. Now, one of the things I did many years ago when I was making the move to, from freelance to agency was um, to come up with a new name for the new business. And it was really difficult. So I went through every testimonial I'd ever had and highlighted the keywords that appeared regularly. And I stuck all of those keywords into a word cloud effectively. And from that came up with a name because I needed something that re reflected the value I added. Now, volume, i.e. scale, is not a USP. How, how many services you offer, how big you are, how many people you reach, how many pro people have that problem, that's not a USP because that's not a niche that scattergun approach is never going to help so this takes legwork and this is why this is something only the bravest business owners do and it means you need to let go of any ego 
you may have started your business or joined the company you're with because you thought it was going to change the world but how are you relevant and important right now today do you actually know what's relevant about you to your audience now so how is Re Eva relevant to Jeanette today what problem does she solve today for Jeanette why did Jeanette call her or email her three times in 24 hours and it's because Eva made herself relevant right now you need to get really really specific so if you're someone who's maybe hammering the PR machine at the moment and pumping out content to try and get coverage and widen the reach of your business if you're doing things like top 10 ways to save money this summer stop again you there's no niche there you need to be doing more legwork here you need to be doing top 10 ways to save money on the running costs of your car this summer top 10 ways to save money on your weekly shoot food shop in the middle of Lidl because then you're going to the target niche that you specialize in because you know where they shop you know they're their car owners you know what areas of their life the cost of living crisis is impacting them in so here's the watch out don't invent a niche because it feels good you have to do the research it's amazing how many startups create a problem to solve for Vanessa that doesn't actually exist in the marketplace don't just ask your wife your friend your mum because they'll tell you exactly what you want to hear ask the market do your research there are so many huge huge social media groups now that you can join for free and poll opinion within your sphere that there is no excuse not to do that research so who does this well students actually do this really well doing work experience or duke of edinburgh projects that kind of thing they're so much better than business owners about focusing on the problem and the audience because they've learned it by rote and they haven't forgotten how important that kind of quantifying and qualifying stage is and we as business owners forget that quite quickly and we skip over it um who does it really badly um have we got any recruiters on yeah. hope not <laughs> um but i would love to hear from really good ones but recruiters tend to be terrible at this because they scatter gun approach and send the wrong jobs to the wrong people because they can't be bothered to do the research okay next slide please sarah how am i doing for time am i okay Oh, good. Time, well, good. Okay, third up. Um, someone give me a name for this exercise. We've had a Brian and a Vanessa. Louise. 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 Okay. <laughs> so it's free, but that doesn't mean it's cheap. Okay, so this is about further qualifying your expertise. So this follows on from my first point. And this one puts the absolute fear into a lot of people. And I know through my entire career, it's been a really contentious topic. And it's probably a topic that's come up in your groups a number of times. When I used to run a networking group a long time ago, we quite often come back full circle to whether people should give stuff away for free, whether that's time, resource, resource or otherwise. And it really divides opinion. And I expect the room's probably pretty divided on this um, based on my past experience. So what is this about and what's it not? This is absolutely not about devaluing your brand or your worth. This is about being brave enough to share openly, even with your competitors and create a dialogue, create connection, create collaboration. And again, half of this is about personal brand. It's about growing your reach, reputation and authenticity. Um, the other half is about demonstrating your value and leaving people absolutely desperate for more. So that manager, Brian, when you kind of feeding him this knowledge and expertise and, get, and giving him stuff for free effectively, you are leaving him absolutely desperate to work with you because he now needs you. Um, now, a little side note, if you're feeling compelled to start an online course because everyone else is, but you really don't want to, you don't have to. This is not about starting a podcast, a webinar, an online course, a networking group even. You, this is about owning your value, what feels right for you. And I'm going to refer back to Kelly and her public speaking and growing her confidence because that's a great example. I'm sure she's going to take those new skills that she's learned and use that to add value and give stuff away for free to potential customers as a hook, as a way of generating new business. So here's what you can go, do. And I will send these out to Sarah and Pete afterwards so they can share them. It's a bit of homework for you, actually. By the end of what day are we on Wednesday? 
um sorry i've totally lost track i had monday off and it's thrown me all week um so by the end of this week or by the end of the weekend even if you've got a busy week make a list of the tools and subscriptions that you have within your job and everyone will have some whether they're design resources or seo tools or access to financial reports whatever it might be say you're an estate agent you're likely to have reports on upcoming hot areas in oxfordshire average selling prices average completion times that kind of thing um what makes a house sell quickly that is absolutely invaluable to your buyer and has, has anyone seen an estate agent do that because i certainly haven't but if i was looking for an estate agent to sell my property and one out of the three i spoke to about their fees said to me catherine um it's really interesting but actually we're finding um gardens with sheds are selling quite quickly much quicker or um houses with loft conversions are absolutely flying and yes you get a little bit of that from good estate agents but who who emails you over a pdf afterwards and says here's my top 10 tips on how you can sell your house most quickly um and you can tailor it if you know your niche if you know who you're talking to if you know if they're ginger head and they own a schnauzer you can absolutely nail this for example, an estate agent who knows their niche is first time buyers because they deal in the lower end value of the property market. Why not create a swap this for that guide uh, of best ways to save money on your first home without compromising on your top three must haves? If you know who you're talking to and you can create free content that you give away to people like that, you are losing nothing. You are not devaluing your brand. You are building your brand. Now, the watch out here is that it has to be bespoke. It has to talk directly to your audience. Who's absolutely tired of those kind of trashy data capture forms that you see online popping up on websites? Uh, get your ultimate guide to running a business and generating one million pounds in your first year, especially when they're from so-called gurus or influencers. They are catch-all ways to get you to hand over your email address and they are crap, they are clickbait. You are better than that. You can create really bespoke content that you can give away on your social media channels via your website, face to face, however it works best for you, that will create that pull factor and that word of mouth that you need to build and grow your business. So who does this well? Marketeers obviously do this really well. Um, SaaS providers, software as a service providers sometimes do this really well if they, if they know their niche interestingly trades people do this really well so builders do this really well um who 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 kind of commissions a builder without a bespoke plan um that is built into their business model their fees include a huge amount of time to give you a bespoke plan whether you go ahead with the the business or, or not because of the level of investment you're making with that tradesperson so this isn't, that's not just sales, that's marketing, it's PR, it's word of mouth, all rolled into one, that, that giving away something for free. Um, who does it badly? Actually, Mark, graphic designers tend to do this really badly. Um, and I'm sure you're totally different to, the, to a lot of graphic designers, but why do graphic designers not take a portfolio to their meeting? Why do they not give away a printed postcard with a piece of artwork that they've designed on it with their phone number on the back? How often... I mean, you you create something tangible and Mark, you talked about print, which gets me really excited because I'm a huge believer in print. And if we've got time, I've got a, a bonus um, piece of advice which talks about um, print. Um, but why not take something tangible with you? People want to look at stuff in the flesh and feel it. So do that. It takes time, but that prep is absolutely worth it. Right. Have I got time for a bonus, Sarah? Go for it. Right, next slide, please. Yay. It's, it's lumpy, but what is it? Okay, lumpy mail. When did you last invest some marketing budget in posting something out to people? I, I cannot express how invaluable this is as a marketing technique, and it needn't cost as lot as you think. All I get through the post these days is ads for gutter cleaning or stuff from estate agents. That's, I mean, or political propaganda. That's it. I very rarely get something through the post that I don't know what it is because it always comes in a brown parcel with a tick on it and it's from Amazon. Um, an arrow, not a tick. 
one of the best marketing campaigns I ever did was called Fed Up of Fluff, Let's Talk. And it was ran, when I ran a PR agency and we posted out branded lint rollers to people yeah. with a little, a little printed postcard that said Fed Up of Fluff, Let's Talk. And it had a handwritten message on the back. And it probably cost me about three pounds per send. And I think we only did 20 of them because if you've got more than 20 or 30 top targets, new business targets, it's too many. You you haven't defined your niche. Um, And my goodness, the response we got from that was out of this world. One send, and this is genuine, it's going to sound really clickbaity. One send resulted in a new four grand a month client called Great Little Breaks at the time we were specializing in hotels and holiday rentals. She had a dog and I don't know if it was a schnauzer. She definitely didn't have ginger hair, but she always had dog hair on her work coat and she'd get to work every morning, hang up a coat and go, oh my God, my black coat is absolutely covered in white hair and used to drive her mad. And it was a bit of a standing joke in the office. And this branded lint roller with our logo on it was indispensable and lived on her desk she saw it every single day and we signed them up as a new client off the back of that campaign it was a cold campaign we'd not spoken to them before we got invited to pitch and we won won the business now your thing doesn't need to be a lint roller you're very welcome to steal that idea because I think it's a brilliant idea but going back to knowing your niche what is relevant to your audience that worked brilliantly for us but please 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 don't know if we've got any branded merch people on. I don't think we have, but don't go for the branded USB. No one uses USBs anymore. Don't go for the tin of mint. <laughs> oh, does Pete use a USB? No, we've got a lot of waving. <laughs> oh, of course we need USBs. What do we put okay. the stand stuff with, on? With, with, with the exception of Eva, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to caveat that actually. <laughs> Um, but don't go for the tin of mints because every trade stand has a crappy tin of mints on it. Go for something unique. Don't go for the cheap, oh, I can get it on four imprint or whatever it is um, for 50p a head. Go for something decent, refine your niche down, send out less, but send out better. Um, so who does this really well? DHL actually do this really well. They send out branded biscuits saying, sorry, um, if they mess up your delivery. Spot on, love that. It was such a great idea. Um, Most Affinity, one of the um, car companies do this well. When you buy a new car from them, they send you a box with an air freshener, a lip balm, a little packet of screen wash, um, a key ring, something, some sweets. Brilliant. What a great perception to leave someone with. And that was post-purchase. So that is about generating word of mouth onwards with new customers. I will absolutely refer them like I have done just now to lots of other people. Um, wine subscription and gin subscription services tend to do this well, putting little snacks in that you've not had before. You know, like those little kind of crispy chili lentil things or those little beanie soya bean things all those lovely things that you would just never buy and you're like actually I really like this brand they do it really well who does it really badly car insurance companies why do car insurance companies not send out a bumper sticker with their policy documents saying I drive with Admiral with a nice little something on it a lot of people especially the older generation will stick that in the back of their car window just because they've received it. No other reason, (laughs) they will stick it there because they've received it and they don't want to put it in the bin. So why do they not do things like that? There's a massive missed opportunity here to get your brand out there front and center. And I mean, this could be a great one for Eva because of the type of services she supplies, some kind of leave behind that she can give to people like Jeanette, who is a prolific networker, um, something she can have on her desk in a shop, something she can post out, think about it. Print is alive and kicking. It's an absolutely underutilized marketing tactic. Um, And that, next slide please, Sarah, is my final piece of advice in being brave. Now, I would like to thank you massively for listening. I know I've rattled through that because I really wanted to squeeze a lot in. I don't know if we have time for questions and if we don't, I would absolutely love to hear your feedback afterwards especially from the Bryans, the Vanessas, the recruiters and the estate agents. Hopefully I haven't offended anyone this morning. Um, And finally, I would be so hugely grateful if you would share a post and tag me in on LinkedIn if you've enjoyed this morning. Take a screenshot, whatever you want to do. I can pull a silly face. We can all, I I know you do lots of waving and stuff, which I absolutely love. Um, 
but I would hugely appreciate it if you would share something maybe there's been one thing that you've written down and you think do you know what that I'm going to give that a go or I hadn't considered that before or I've been putting that off I would absolutely love to know what that one thing is it would give me huge huge pride um, and pleasure in knowing what you've taken away from this morning and I hope it's been valuable I've thoroughly enjoyed it and what a fantastic group and um, yeah I appreciate the opportunity to speak to you all this morning thank you Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm just going to dismantle.